Most people think animation, and they still think Saturday morning cartoons, dayglow heroes, cackling villains, crashing and walloping. But animation wasn't always for children. In fact, early animation was surrealist, sexual, and adult. So much so that during World War II, the US Army commissioned Warner Brothers to create a series of cartoons for US troops titled Private Snafu. Or Situation Normal, All F***ed Up. Both to educate on subjects like the dangers of rumours spreading around a base, shown here via the metaphor of flying sausages. And baloney is flying all over the place. And to raise troop morale. Boy! Back home. But over the years this changed, and by the 50s, animation was really only made for children. Until, in recent years, animation made for adult audiences began to re-emerge, which are increasingly emotive, experimental and challenging. So, why the comeback? Why was animation seen as being for kids in the first place? And why does COVID-19 mean that the future of animation could be adult? The first thing to note about attitudes towards animation is that it's generational. Just look at Adult Swim, whose audience is about half the age of that of its late night competitors. How did you not recognize me? Didn't you create the disguises? Older generations are much less likely to watch animation now, and I think that that's rooted in the kind of animation that they grew up with. To find out what that was, I called up my dad, a quintessential boomer. So I think in the in the 1960s there was a definite style that came out of America, led primarily by Hanna Barbera, one studio in Los Angeles, and they had a very definite style there. But in hindsight, when you look back at them now, they look fairly primitive. These cartoons are what were known as limited animations. This kind of stuff. Well, that there is no stick, Mr. Wizard. And the fucking Bronco. Yeah, that's a joke, son. Eight. Emerging in the 50s, this was a new form of cheaply made animation aimed squarely at children, commissioned for the sudden explosion of TV ownership in Western living rooms in the 50s. They put a bear on a box! These limited animations were programmed in a block on Saturday mornings, a fairly arbitrary decision which was actually based around radio scheduling in previous years, back when radio was the centrepiece of the Western living room and children's radio shows about action heroes and superpowers were the prime entertainment for kids. I'll never speak another word of it as long as I live. These shows were kind of the basis for TV cartoons being commissioned, and thus the Saturday morning cartoon was born. They don't call me Buffalo Bill for nothing! Where in the 30s and the 40s animation's golden age was funded by shorts that would play before full movies in theatres, early TV animation was a massive step backwards, both creatively and technically. 1959's Clutch Cargo showcases some great examples of cost-cutting, combining footage of real mouths with illustration to get around having to animate lip-sync. Oh boy, the plot gets thicker! You sound pretty happy, Scotty. And leaning heavily on simply moving still images around a frame for the action scenes. Although there were a couple of exceptions, and some cartoons that were more witty or inventive, these limited animations established what cartoons would be for decades, until, in 1989, something changed that would shape how the next generation would understand animation. The first animation on primetime in 25 years, The Simpsons was an immediate, massive hit, peaking at 33 million viewers in its first season and selling billions in Bartmania merch. We're all familiar with Groening's revolutionary family cartoon, a portrait of modern America that was sometimes crass and bawdy, but wide-reaching, looking at capitalism, gender roles, politics, everything, really. It's in Revelations, people! We still feel the legacy of The Simpsons. For years after its launch, in the words of Alex Hirsch of Gravity Falls, adult animation has basically been an arms race of different ways to copy The Simpsons. It opened the doors to a bunch of cartoons that were aimed at adults, though they were all kind of tonally similar. As the man, I order you to give me permission to go to this party. We're gonna get rich and famous just by eating. But in the last few years, animation has become way more diverse, experimental, and emotionally complex. So, why now? 
To understand the recent explosion of creativity in adult animation, it's worth looking at what the young people who are watching it grew up with, which was a way more varied slate of animation than their elders. You've never seen it before. Excellent, Igor. We rocked Bart Simpson backpacks, we spun Beyblades in the schoolyard, and we endlessly quoted South Park. Man, that movie gets better every time I see it. You had the cable boom, and at the time, there was so much work in TV because these 24-hour networks were coming in. 24 hours a day on cable TV. In some cities, cable meant going from three channels to 50, with much more specialised channels like MTV, Nickelodeon and Adult Swim showing animation that was experimental, raw and adult. Of course, whilst all this was happening, far across the Pacific Ocean, animation was already adult. Like, really adult. In the 90s and the early 2000s, anime increasingly found its way to Western eyeballs through import DVDs, late night TV, and the emergence of internet piracy. A previously niche industry was really opening up, showing the West that animation could tackle challenging subjects like grief, corruption, even nuclear war, and be downright stylish to boot. <coughs> So, how did anime become adult? Well, it initially followed a similar trajectory to Western animation. Experimental beginnings, a golden age of cinema, and then limited animations ushered in by early TV. <laughs> anime like Astro Boy, itself hugely influenced by Western character designs, using budget techniques like looping frames and zooms on stills. It was made for kids, but some of its ideas in cinematography were pretty amazing. Anime in Japan diverged from its Western counterparts in the 70s, when various economic crises hit Japan's economy and shut down the larger studios. In the years of recession that followed, and amidst a tougher, austere climate, more tonally mature series were commissioned. 74's Space Battle Yamato channeled this bleak mood. A quest to cleanse the Earth of radiation after nuclear bombardment by enemy forces. <laughs> It was an exploration of Japan's recent military history and, of course, the aftermath of the nuclear attacks on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The success of Battleship inspired a generation of adult anime that used the medium to grapple with Japan's brutal recent past of conflicts and natural disaster. Anime was a way to engage either indirectly, the 80s market was saturated with shows set in post-apocalyptic landscapes, from Nausicaa to the Fist of the North Star, or head-on, like 83's Barefoot Gen, written by a survivor of Hiroshima, which shows the event in this really shocking, brutally graphic way. These 80s and 90s creations set a tone for the industry that would last for years afterwards, culminating in shows well-loved by Western creators and audiences today. My point with all of this is that today's creators and audiences were brought up with a fresh mindset that animation can be for kids, but it can also be adult and challenging, and can show things not possible in any other medium. In the words of Brad Graeber of Powerhouse Animation, who make Netflix's Castlevania, My generation was heavily influenced by Looney Tunes, the Disney films, that kind of thing. The talent that's coming in now is influenced by anime. Powerhouse credit Kintaro Miyara's Berserk manga as a major inspiration on Castlevania, citing its dark fantasy style of storytelling, character design, and how gory it gets. It doesn't take a genius to spot this kind of inspiration and cross-pollination on work commissioned all across the medium. Busted. What's going on? <laughs> Coco Chanel, may her memory be blessed! So that kind of brings us to right now. Let's cast our crystal ball to the future of animation. Before the events of 2020, adult animation was already the fastest growing genre, particularly with the rise of streaming services. Netflix creates this creative opportunity to, to tell stories that are not necessarily conventional because the audience is, is, is looking for that. These services open the doors to more variations of genres and to more formats of animation. Anthology shows like Love, Death and Robots, or, on the other end of the spectrum, shorts like Forky Asks a Question. 
technologies lowering entry points mean that some of the best animation these days is coming out of online passion projects, squeezed into fill gaps in documentaries, or even in advertising. Metamorphosis. Not to read. But it's film that continues to push the industry. Loving Vincent uses thousands of hand-painted frames to explore the mental health of the artist in his last days. The Breadwinner mixes traditional 2D storytelling with stop-motion inspired sequences to weave in this kind of great meta-narrative about Arabic folklore. And Into the Spider-Verse uses flashes of 2D trickery to make our hero look even more badass, having fun with its multitudes of realities along the way. How many more spider people are there? Same as the Comic-Con. What's coming? Let's go! Whoa! But for me, it's Bojack Horseman that is really the pinnacle of modern animation. Its crass visual style gets really experimental as the seasons go on, using rough visuals to depict the internal struggles of his characters. You're a real stupid piece of shit, and everywhere you go you destroy people. Of course your mother never loved you, what do you expect? And their internal drug trips. Bojack's creator points out that the show works because of the contrast of its style and content. Because it's animated and it's like a horse and it's bright and colorful, it just takes on a different feel and you can kind of sneak attack into sadness in some fun, surprising ways. But here's the thing. This kind of animation, surreal, experimental, challenging, it's nothing new. In fact, it's actually where animation began. Let's go back. Way back. The earliest animation, over a century before Bojack or Undone, originated from vaudeville stage acts, and, like our modern talking horse, works by the likes of Emil Cole were surrealist, explorations of the mind and of adult life, depicting cigarettes and alcohol, like these two scallywags, sneaking out of a saloon in 1917's Mutt and Jeff. It doesn't end well. Because these animations were made as cinematic 15-minute shorts to play alongside other films, they were made for audiences of all ages, and so fun characters like Felix the Cat could, much like Bojack, use a cutesy exterior to explore current adult issues like unions and workers' strikes, moonshine in the prohibition, even Hollywood filmmaking. But it's the surrealism of these early works that contemporary animators keep returning to. Fleischer Studios in the 30s really pushed this mad aesthetic, particularly with the notorious Betty Boop. You can see from their take on Snow White how wonderfully mad and experimental their work became, and the lasting impact that their work had. So what feels like a fresh evolution of the medium is really just a return to its roots. Western animation was slowly becoming more adult, until, that is, this year, when suddenly everything changed, in animation and in the entire world. Let's talk Covid. Cases have been confirmed around the world. I shook hands with everybody. I'm not a doctor. It's impossible to guess the long-term effects of this horrible virus on the industry, but animation is well placed to cope. In the subtle words of the animation director JJ Villard, we are the cockroaches of the atom bomb. We are the only survivors of quarantine right now. There's no live action moving. Show business is, is running with animation right now in, in a huge way. That's basically because the pipelines of modern computer-based animation studios means that artists can generally easily work from home, even offering animation to fill in gaps in live action shows like The Blacklist. You completely fooled me. That's because animation has always relied on remote work and outsourcing across the globe dating back to the 60s, when American creators would send storyboards across the ocean to Japanese studios, and then animation would be shipped back months later. These days, files transfer in seconds, and the chances are that your favourite cartoon was animated abroad. It's hard to guess what a post-lockdown world looks like, but it's possible to be optimistic for animation's future. In other words... Lightning's striking right now for us animators. It's not going to happen again for a very long time, just attack right now. Right now is the time to strike. For centuries, paintings were the dominant form of art, methods of telling stories in ways that were also mythic, dreamlike expressions of the mind's imagination, of deep emotional reflections. Animation can be the modern day equivalent of that. It can mix the farcical and the exaggerated with the capacity to take us anywhere to use metaphor to tackle challenging and contemporary questions, and to explore our interior lives. 
adult animation is partially returning because our commissioning channels now have the kind of detailed analytics that show a real clear hunger for mature animation and the ability to micro-target increasingly niche audiences. But I wonder if adult animation is also kind of a product of this very specific cultural moment that we're in. Anime matured during Japan's recession in the 70s, and perhaps the same is true of Western animation today. Where the 90s had shows about content, impossibly prosperous, incompetent men No, my bottom's big! Today's cartoons, post-financial crash, tackle dead-end jobs and toxic masculinity, internships and alcoholism. They celebrate diversity, and they explore mental health. Animation is coming full circle to its challenging, adult roots. And as our world becomes ever more complex and fractured, so too, hopefully, will our cartoons. Alright folks, thank you so much for watching this whole video. If you enjoyed it, please drop me a like and hit subscribe, and let me know in the comments what your favourite adult animation is.